What's up, y'all? How are you doing tonight? Hello. Oh, come on, we have some great panelists attending virtually, and y'all are gonna give me that energy. That's that y'all are making me say. All right, well, we'll try one more time. We'll, we'll try one more time. What's up, y'all? How are you doing tonight? Hello. All right, you know that's a little better. I know it's chilly outside, so you're probably trying to conserve your energy so that you stay warm. Uh, thank you for attending tonight's alumni speaker series, Careers in Exercise Science panel. We had six wonderful, uh, fantastic panelists to talk about their experience today, and uh, I'm going to introduce them. They're going to describe a little bit about their journey and a little bit about their day to day, and then we'll open the floor up for y'all to ask them questions, uh, anything that you might find on your mind. Sounds good? Cool. All right. So we have uh, with with us today, we have Tito Hernandez, class of 19, master's 2022. He's a physical education teacher and head strength and conditioning coach for Ithaca High School. We have Justin Pump, class of 2012, master's 2016. He is a PhD and he has a, he is a fitness director for Whitney for Weekend Health. We have Eric Leroy, class of 13, who's a cardiology research physiologist for the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. We have Cable McCandles, class of 19, master's 2021. He's a graduate assistant of biomechanics, injury prevention, and rehabilitation, and a PhD candidate for kinesiology and exercise science. We have Monica Siroj, class of 2008, uh, who is an occupational therapist, uh, a pediatric occupational therapist for North Country Kids. And we have Devin Serrano, class of 2012, doctor in athletic training, who is the director of sports medicine uh, for Sweet Briar College. Uh, welcome, panelists. Thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, I want to open the floor and allow you to really talk about your journey and a little bit about what your day to day role is. So we'll start with Justin. What's your journey and what's your day to day role? Sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me too. I think that I've had just about every single job in fitness and Hey Kev, how's it going? Long time. No see. Um, I, I graduated in 2012 and then Cortland actually gave me my, my first job. I was the head strength and conditioning coach at Cortland for four years. So right out of college, I was really, I was interested in strength and conditioning. I wanted to work with athletes. Um, that was my goal. Uh, and then did that for four years. But at the same time, I was getting really interested in being able to help people that might not currently be physically active because of all the health benefits associated with exercise. And that lend itself more to some kind of health behavior change program. So in 2017, after about nine years at Cortland, I left. Um, I still miss it sometimes. And I moved to Boston to pursue my PhD in exercise and health sciences. And so that, that was a four-year plan. Uh, I, I see some of you are uh, in your PhD right now. I had, the, I had the good luck of proposing for my dissertation about a month before campus shut down because of COVID. So that was a nice, uh, nice opportunity to actually pivot uh, to an online behavior change intervention where I help people that were not engaging in resistance trying to get started. Um, and then the intervention actually was successful. And these papers take a while to publish. We we finally just got a dissertation published last year. So um, after you finish your PhD, you kind of have a couple different routes. You could go a postdoc route, which is a research-based route. You could go into teaching um, or you could go into, into industry. And so I went the postdoc route. So I, I went to Brandeis University and I did about a year and a half of research and Actually, I, you know, if you want a little bit of advice, I got, I was reached out to by the medical director for a, a medical weight loss company. His name was Dr. Spencer Nadolsky. And he was actually somebody that I met when I was at Cortland. And that was about eight, nine years ago. And what this company does is uh, they prescribe GLP-1 medications, which are weight loss medications for overweight or obese adults. They have a team of dietitians, and then they wanted somebody to lead their fitness side of the plan. So they hired me on as, as the fitness director. And this was when it was just a startup company. So I started when there was just a few thousand members. And uh, 
only a few months later, we got acquired by Weight Watchers, which is kind of a bummer because I um, I signed on to get equity in the company. So if it actually had happened about four years later, I'd be super rich right now. Um, but that's okay. Um, so we got bought by Weight Watchers in April. And so we've, we've been integrating with them right now. So, so my day-to-day is I'm responsible for basically making sure that everybody that's on a weight loss medication is engaging in resistance training. Part of that is... Um, making the programs for for everybody, which is which is relatively generic. It involves you know speaking to people that might have injuries that need modifications to their plan. Uh, it involves hosting group events with people, and um, it also involves having one on one consultations if people are are struggling with some need, and needing some motivational support. Um, I do also still conduct research. So a lot of the research I really do right now is to focus on um, basically laying the groundwork for resistance training as being an important type of physical activity for public health and then designing interventions to help people uh, engage in it. So i um, happy to answer any questions that you might have later. Thank you, Justin. Uh, that <laughs> sounds like a very uh, interesting path. And now, Tito, what's a little bit of your story? What's your day to day like? Uh, all right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tito, uh, Coach T. Some call me that. Um, that's funny that Justin's actually on here because um, he was the one that inspired me to be a strength and conditioning coach, which is what I do now. Um, I had a class over at Park Center. And he was teaching like, you know, a dynamic warm up, And then he had us do some conditioning. At that point, I wasn't too familiar what a strength and conditioning coach was. But I had been doing some personal training at that time at the Student Life Center. But anyways, you know, what's up, Justin? Good to see you. Glad to see you're doing big things. Um, yeah. Give him, giving him a little props for that because, yeah, seeing him do that inspired me and I said like I could do this and and I just went for it um previous to my role now at Ithaca High School um I worked at uh, an affiliate level with um professional baseball I worked with the Orioles and the athletics prior to this job um so those were really cool experiences um I got my start actually with Cortland baseball as a as an intern so I just Walked into Coach Brown's office one day and, and asked to see if I could help out. Uh, um, did my own research, got my feet wet, volunteered a couple times um, with the SUNY Cortland Strength and Conditioning, just a couple times. A um, couple internships after that, one thing led to another. Um, and here I am um, on a day to day basis. Uh, I work with pretty much all teams, guys, girls, they, thems. Um, I provide programming. Um, some of my philosophies are just injury prevention, um, functional training, um, you know, just working out some of those imbalances. And yeah, I, I really like what I do. Um, yeah, so anything that you want to know, feel free to ask. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tito. I love that we already have like a connection of. Some people inspiring people here today. Hopefully that kind of transcends itself off the screen to the people in this room, which I know it will. Uh, so Devin, tell us a little bit about your story and what's your day to day like? Um, so again, my name is Devin Serrano. I was class of 2012 at Cortland as well. Um, but I actually was a transfer into Cortland. So I didn't come in until halfway through my sophomore year. Um, thanks to the recession. <laughs> so I came in, um, was originally going to be an athletic training major, but in order to graduate on time, I went the exercise science route. Um, I ended up um, after, after Cortland going to Shenandoah University in Virginia for about a summer to get my feet wet in the world of athletic training. Uh, went home to Westchester for a year and worked primarily in a, two physical therapy clinics and as an EMT, which is actually a certification I got while at Cortland. I rode for SCEMS. And then I went to grad school in Pennsylvania at Bloomsburg University, which is where I got my uh, ability to take the BOC exam to become an athletic trainer. Um, and during my time there, I worked with the smallest high school in the state of Pennsylvania, as well as Bucknell University uh, men's lacrosse and football. So I went from super tiny to division one. 
post that, I went to the ESPN Wild World of Sports Complex at in Orlando at Disney World for a semester, then to the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. I was primarily with women's volleyball, but at one point I also had football responsibilities and I was also in charge of women's basketball and women's softball. So I had three division ones plus uh, football. After that, I went to uh, Auburn University to for my fellowship and I was actually stationed at Fort Benning in Columbus, Georgia, where I was the primary athletic trainer for um, the 1st Battalion, 50th Infantry uh, di uh, Division. So I was there while starting um, my doctorate in athletic training uh, through Indiana State. I was in their first um, accredited cohort. So I, that was while I was at Louisiana and Auburn. And then after Auburn, I came to Sweetbriar, which is where I have been ever since. And I've been here since August of 2016. Um, and up until this year, I was also the only athletic trainer here at Sweetbriar. So I would manage all of our athletes. So I have 12 teams currently that we are responsible for. And then when I have all that free time, um, I'm also a volunteer with the U.S. Olympic Committee. So I've done rotations at Chula Vista and Lake Placid training centers. And last January, I went to um, world championships in Espot, Spain with the U.S. Paralympic team. And last, and then I also do research specifically on equestrian athletes because that's a huge team that we have here at Sweetbriar. So I have published a return to ride uh, concussion management protocol. It's currently, we believe, the only known one um, that's ever been published. Um, and I actually present I've presented that in several different places, including at the sixth international consensus conference on concussion in sport, which was in uh, Amsterdam last October. So. That's my quick my quick rundown of that. And then day to day, again, I have an assistant and I have about 150 athletes, give or take, um, on 12 different teams. So we manage just everything from concussions to prehab to rehab to, you know, mental health uh, referrals, um, being a shoulder to cry on, being their biggest cheerleader, one of those truly a jack of all trades profession. Wow been a lot of places. I'm really interested. Thank you, Devin. Um, Eric, what's a little bit of your story? What's a little bit of your day today? Hi, yes. Uh, my name's Eric. Um, uh, great to to meet you all and, and great to see all the exercise science majors uh, here tonight. Um, it's really cool to see. Uh, and thank you all for, for sharing so far. Um, something that I just wanted to piggyback on was something uh, Kevin or Tito said. Uh, is that he kind of just walked in somewhere and and asked to help out. And I, I can't emphasize enough how far that goes. There's been so many situations in my life where there was something or somewhere that I wanted to get involved in. And I just said, Hey, can I, can I just hang out? Can I help out? Can I volunteer? And um, it's led to so many great things. So uh, regardless of the degree or, or, uh, you know, uh, um, position you hold, uh, just just showing that kind of enthusiasm and offering to just volunteer or, or intern somewhere does go a really uh, long way. Uh, I, I'm currently an exercise physiologist for the NYU School of Medicine. Uh, going back uh, to Cortland, I, I graduated in 2013 with uh, an exercise science major. I immediately went to grad school at the University of Georgia. Uh, for uh, clinical exercise physiology. And I, looking back, I always wonder if I made the wrong decision or not, and I should just stop thinking about it. But I, I could have went to Adelphi University on Long Island for free uh, for a grad assistant uh, program. And I just wanted to go to the University of Georgia because it sounded cool. So uh, I did that and I'm, I'm gonna be paying for that uh, for a very long time, <laughs> but uh, it was still a great experience and I, 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 I don't regret it. Um, met a lot of good people and, and connections and anyway since then uh i mean the journey was i don't know if i can fit it all onto into a few minutes but I'll, I'll i'll try to summarize i i started working as an exercise physiologist at the hospital that i did my internship at uh that was per diem one day a week but back in 2014 exercise physiologist positions were 
very scarce, uh, at least from what I see online. It's not like it is now. There seems to be a lot of positions now for for hospitals and and in the healthcare field. Um, back then, there just there just wasn't, and and the the pay was uh, much worse than it is now too. So, um, so I I got out of grad school and all of a sudden I had a job that was one day a week and obviously that's not enough to pay the bills. So, um, I ended up finding another position that was also per diem, which ended up being one day a week at a, at a skilled nursing facility, which is, which is basically a, um, uh, nursing home, if you will. Um, so, uh, that, you know, I was living at home, so not making enough money was okay for the time being, but uh, obviously I wanted more. I uh, was able to find a position at a cardiology practice. And there I basically just monitored, uh, not monitored. I read the telemetry that would come back from, from patients wearing Holter monitors. So I learned a lot of EKG. Uh, I got a lot of EKG experience there. Um, and if I saw something funny that I didn't know, I would ask a cardiologist and they would teach me. Um from there, I was hired full-time at the cardiology practice. That lasted about a year and a half or so. Uh, after that, my family wanted to move to North Carolina, so I decided to go with them. Lived in North Carolina for about two years. I, when I first got there, I worked as a personal trainer for about a month, and I hated that. I didn't make any money. It's not for me. Um, it is for some people. It is not for me. I'm not a salesman. I don't. Just, I hated it. Um after a month, luckily, I was hired at a hospital there, and that was my first full-time position as an exercise physiologist in a healthcare setting. It was in a cardiac rehab. It was a small hospital. Um, again, pay was still very low. I mean, it wasn't bad for North Carolina, but um, it was a small hospital. They didn't have a lot of resources to, to give out. Um, it, it was a small team. Uh, and the, the program itself in terms of patient population just kept growing and growing and there was no help in sight. And it was just, um, it was, it was too much for, for the three person team that we were. Um, and I also just started to miss New York. If you're from the Northeast, it's, it is kind of hard to live anywhere else. So, uh, I reached out to the cardiology office that I was working at prior uh, to see if they needed help. And, and sure enough, they did in, in a different department. It was in the uh, nuclear medicine department. They needed someone doing stress tests. Uh, so I said, I'd be happy to do that. Moved back to New York, started doing that. Uh, again, wasn't the highest paying job, but but all of these things, and I'm, and I'm saying all these things because all of this experience does accumulate and it did help me to get to where I currently am. Um, having experience there doing those stress tests all day, every day, um, allowed me to, um, I got a position at a private medical practice in Manhattan. Um, it was very, very startup-y. Um, it, it was not your typical healthcare. It was, it was the, the patients were um, basically the 1%. They paid out of pocket for everything. And, um, you know, money was not an issue, which is not typically what you see if you go into healthcare. Um, that was really cool at first, but, it, but, after after some time there, it was not um, very employee friendly. The, the HR was not good. It wasn't managed well. It just wasn't good to the employees. It was it was a very long hours hours for not a lot of uh, incentive. Um, but I got experience there also um, doing VO two max tests on these patients and discussing things that I probably normally wouldn't in a regular healthcare setting regarding um, endocrinology, uh, metabolic data, blood sugar, glucose um, data. We use CGMs a lot, so it was cool to interpret that kind of data. Um, and then I started really getting into research uh, and I knew that I didn't want to work there forever. So I started applying to some some more positions and I, I got the position uh, that, I, that I'm at now, which is NYU School of Medicine. So here I, uh, I work mostly actually at Bellevue Hospital. They're kind of affiliated. Uh, I, our patient demographic is um, very um, um, different from what I had seen. They, they're mostly um, either uninsured or undocumented. Um, 
English is like the the least frequent language we see. We have very good interpreters. Um, and a typical day there is in taking these patients into our program, which involves uh, stress tests, um, monitoring their telemetry during their exercise classes, responding to any adverse effects or health issues that may come up uh, during that. Uh, but again, I, I knew I wanted to do research and NYU happens to be a very good place for that. There's there's tons of studies going on um, and I'm involved in a few now. So I happen to have a, a, a very good supervisor that lets me kind of step aside and go over to the NYU building and help out with with studies that are taking place there. Uh, and I do VO2 max tests for those. Um, we do virtual or, or telehealth cardiac rehab research out of NYU. So we, we are testing out uh, software for uh, remote cardiac rehab that the study should be ending somewhat soon. And hopefully the publication will be out. That will be really interesting. Um, so that is typically uh, the day that I have uh, where I currently am, and and my journey was a, a long and convoluted one, but uh, I hope I hope someone benefits from hearing that. So thanks. Thank you. I certainly have a lot of experiences um, and a lot of uh, stuff in your journey. Abel, what about you? Hey everybody. Um, so my name's Cable. I was at Cortland. Um, I graduated in twenty nineteen and twenty twenty one with my bachelor's and master's, both in exercise science. Um, when I was at Cortland, I was on their cross country track and field team. So I ran through my five years there. Um, and during grad school, I was um, a graduate assistant during my master's. So I was teaching biomechanics lab classes for Dr. Bauer at the time. Um, and that kind of kickstarted like my interest in biomechanics specifically. So it's more studying like the physics behind our movements. Um, from there, Kind of during my master's and after my master's, I was doing some consulting work. So I was helping out with the United States Olympic Committee um, with their track and field teams and their diving teams, doing some motion analysis um, from other practice competitions or like actual competitions, like uh, previous Olympic competitions with athletes. We kind of break down their, uh, their movements, especially with the divers and the pole vaulters and track um, to kind of better understand like the physics and like why certain movements give them certain scores or why certain movements like didn't clear the bar, clear the bar. Now we can kind of make that, you know, more ideal going into a, a competition setting. So that was really cool getting that applied aspect. Um, I still do some of that stuff. So that contract was about a two year contract with the Olympic committee. Um, I still do consulting with like motion analysis. I'm working with a kind of a startup tech company right now that does that with runners. So it's running motion analysis to try to help get people, um, with certain forms uh, fitted for specifically running shoes, right? So that way people aren't wearing the, running, the wrong running shoes and getting injured or something like that. Um, so that's sort of my industry work that I do on the side. Uh, my main thing right now is I'm working on my PhD, so my doctorate degree in kinesiology at uh, New Mexico State University. Um, so this is down in Las Cruces in New Mexico. I've been here, this will be my third year here now. Um, so I'm basically done with taking classes and I'm just working on my dissertation work, which is research. And that research is based on biomechanics. Um, so it's about the biomechanics of fatigue and how as we get tired, either physically or mentally, how that changes our form during movement and can influence our performance or our rate of injury. Um, so that sort of stuff is is really interesting to me. Um, with my graduate assistantship, how that works is it's mainly teaching. So Monday through Friday, I'm teaching classes usually activity courses like running classes or biomechanics classes, the lecture or the lab side. And then um, in my free time is when I do all my research. So I've worked on a couple different projects with like different teams, um, football, tennis, uh, cross country track and field, doing all this sort of motion analysis, understanding, you know, joint angles or the forces and how that's influencing people's performance. And I've been able to give a couple of different research talks around the country, um, a couple in Canada here and there based on those um, research talks. So a pretty good blend of like academia work, um, industry work, and research. Um, I know people in the in the talk are more like rehabilitation or more clinical stuff, but mine's definitely a focus on like sports biomechanics um, and how we can keep athletes healthy and keep their performance at that sort of upper echelon level. Thank you, Cable. Um, Abel, what about you? Working on movement sounds really interesting. Uh, that's really cool. 
Monica, what about you? What's a little bit of your journey? What's your day-to-day -day like? Hi, everyone. Um, I don't have an as illustrious of a resume as the others, so prepare not to be blown away. But I am a pediatric occupational therapist. I work in early intervention, which is children age zero to three, the most fun age, in my opinion. Um, what that entails is what we call itinerant work. So I go into the homes of the kids and work with the parents and the children. And I go into some of the preschools. So as regarding occupational therapy, a lot of people don't know what we do. And I'm sure most of the people in this room probably have never even heard of it. <laughs> So the basis of occupational therapy, what everything we do in life is considered an occupation. Cooking is an occupation. Being a parent is an occupation. Um, being a student is an occupation. Um, ADLs and bathing is an occupation. So what we do is use the combination of activity and occupation to um, reach client goals. So for example, um, Let's say I had a client, an older client with a shoulder injury. Um, rather than just doing boring, redundant um, lifting exercises, things like this, I might have them do a painting activity where I work on um, shoulder endurance, upper extremity strength, um, and fine motor skills. Um, so using painting as an activity in therapy. So Again, working with these younger children, a lot of them have developmental delays, gross motor and fine motor delays, haven't met their milestones. Um, of about half my caseload is on the autism spectrum. And then I have one that is with Down syndrome. They all have um, different goals. And at this age group, the goals are created by the family, what they would like to see their child accomplish. And it's called um, an interdisciplinary family service plan. So, um, we work with the families and um, kind of teach them how they can carry over with their children and play with their children that helps support their goals and developments. Um, and at this, in this setting, early intervention, it is very important to work hand in hand with the, with the family. That's the, that's the basis of this setting. So um, we do progress notes. We contribute to IEP writing. We attend IEP meetings. Um, we work on primitive reflexes. We helped um, connect them to necessary services. So for example, I have a family that I'm meeting with them in the um, local autism alliance to help connect them with services. Um, and if we do suspect a child has a diagnosis that is not, um, not officially diagnosed such as autism, which often occurs, we, we are the ones that um, have that conversation with the family. Um, so we go into, again, we go into the homes. It leads for me to travel um, place to place. And honestly, it's really fun. I mean, all the kids are three and under, you know, it's, <laughs> they're really fun to work with. Um, and we use, um, with children, usually play is the main activity and occupation of children that we use to help accomplish their goals. So um, as you can see, I went to graduated SUNY Cortland 2008, I changed majors three times and I graduated a year late and then I got my master's at um, 2022. So quite the time gap there. Um, what I want to tell you guys, which I feel is very important, and I was telling um, everyone on the panel that I wish someone had had this conversation with me. Graduating Cortland, you think you sometimes know what you want to do with a major and you have an idea. Um, my problem was I liked so many things that I didn't know what to narrow it down. I had so many interests. So what really helped me narrow down occupational therapy? I, I had a chance encounter bringing a patient to um, an evaluation before discharge. I worked in patient psychiatry for about 14 years. But um, my best advice to you, if you have even any remote interest in any occupation, whether it's um, anything that all of us panelists do, um, anything related to anything, talk to people in that field, sit down, meet with them, job shadow, all of those things. There's some things I thought, hey, maybe I'll like this. And I did some job shadow shadowing and just talked with people. And it was just absolutely not. Do not press yourself. Take your time. This is what you're trying to do for the rest of your life, right? You 
talk to as many people as you can and just um, meet with people. People love to tell you about their jobs and would love to have you shadow. Um, don't press yourself to decide right away. Sometimes it takes time to, to find the right fit and the thing you really fall into. Hearing all of our stories, none of us started out where we are right now. You know, we, we all went through different pathways and different job routes and different experiences. And to be honest, my graduate application with all the different experiences I had, the graduate, graduate committee told me that because I had all that vast experience and um, different things on my resume, that's what really attracted them to me as a candidate. So if, if you don't figure it out right before graduation, that's okay. There's no timeline that people need to finish by. There was a guy in my graduation class that graduated at 50 with his master's. So um, don't press yourselves too much. You really got to love what you do so that you don't start over again, right? <laughs> so that's about me. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for that, Monica. And that is great advice. Uh, sometimes I talk to students as a career coach and they wonder, well, what's next for me? Uh, and the answer is just try something out and then answer that question. Ask that question again. But with that being said, now that you know a little bit more about the panelists, about what they do, about their roles, about their experiences, I want to open the floor to y'all and to you in Zoom. What questions do you have for panelists? Uh, and if you ask a question, all I ask is that you just introduce yourself, your class year, and your major. Yeah, right here. Um, hi, my name is Dan. Uh, I'm a junior and I'm in exercise science. Uh, I have a question for Tito. Um, for strength and conditioning, did you have to do any like grad school or how much grad school did you have to do? So you need a four year degree minimum to sit for the CSCS, Certified Strength and Conditioning Specialist Test. Um, you don't necessarily need a master's degree. I went ahead and got one um, just because I wanted to con continue to learn and, you know, a little more education will definitely set you apart, you know, from other candidates. And I actually got my master's in phys ed and kind of my um, selling point is if you can teach it to a kid, you can teach it to anyone. So that was kind of the perspective I looked at it from. Thank you. Anybody else have a question for the panelists? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my name is Isaac Holden. I'm a junior in fitness development. Uh, another question for Tito. On top of the CSCS, what other certifications do you hold? <laughs> um, I actually, I got the FMS, functional movement screen, um, one and two, um, precise, precision nutrition, nutrition is another one, um, NASM, certified personal training. That's a good one to start because they blend, you know, you get a lot of knowledge about the general population, um, common, you know, muscular imbalances, uh, corrective exercises. You get a lot of ideas about that with some like athletics as well mixed in there. So I definitely recommend the NASM certified personal training as a start. Um, that's a good one. FMS too. Um, yeah. Any other questions? What other questions do we got? Anybody in the Zoom have any questions? Oh, right there in the back. Hi, Elizabella. I'm a student exercise science major, and I was wondering if any of you had any um, interview tips for PT school, D school, PhD program. All right. Um, did y'all hear that question? Cool games. Any interview tips for getting into grad programs? Um. I guess I can chime in first since regarding OTPT school, things like that. Honestly, just be yourself. Um, a lot of these, especially at the grad school level, um, and a lot of um, our careers are very much um, working with people, interacting with people. They, they would just like to um, see who you are genuinely as a person, um, how, um, compassionate, empathic you are, how good of a communicator you are, um, and things like that, um, the types of interests you have. Um, I would say that they will kind of 
ask you questions. Don't try to sound so scripted. Just speak from your mind and heart, and they'll be able to recognize the difference if you're sounding a little, I don't want to say over-prepared, but they're, they're wanting to hear it from you, not what would sound like something you would post on paper to look really good, if that makes sense. That would be my personal suggestion. Um, kind of jumping off from that, I would also have a good understanding of what is your why? What what got you to this point? What makes you want to go into that field? So, you know, was it, I, I got into athletic training because I, you know, blew out my knee and that's how I found this profession and I fell in love with it ever since. Or is it because of a mentor, you know, like Tito was saying with Justin, like, what is your why? And that is something that like, I, I think, I think it was Monica who said, it's like, we will, we will all talk about our jobs if we love it. So it's like, tell us why you want to mm -hmm. join us, essentially. Yeah. I think that's a great point too, because I remember, you know, first day of grad school, who are you? Where's, tell us about yourself. And every single one of us had a connection to occupational therapy. Um, somehow uh, either being a client or someone connected to it. Personally, my father had a stroke when I was younger. So I saw um, a lot of PTOT things, how, how they really serviced and helped my family. Um, and everyone in my class had some kind of personal connection where they received services or someone really close to them received services. So I think that's um, a great point, Devin. They, they really will enjoy what's your personal connection to the career you're seeking? Um, because essentially it's we all have some kind of connection to it, which drives us towards it. To add to that, I would say um, we're in the business of people, right? So how can you, you know, display that genuine care, right, for people that you're working with? Um, also, like, know your strengths, know your weaknesses. Um, and don't be afraid to be a little vulnerable in a sense of you're open to growth, right? You're just starting off. You're not going to know everything, Um as somebody who's going to hire, I would want somebody who who has a growth mindset, who understands that they still got a long way to go and is open to admitting that. So, you know, put your ego aside and, you know, but also have the confidence to say, like, this is what I bring to the table. These are the unique, you know, intangibles that I that I can bring, um, you know, to the team. Right. So look at it from that perspective as well. I can talk a little bit about, and maybe some of the other PhD students want to chime in. Um, the The application for getting into a PhD actually felt a little bit more like dating than applying for a job interview. Basically, you would you would want to find somebody that you would want to work with first. Like you would have to find someone where you have a mutual interest. I like your work. I want to be a part of your team, and you send an email out to a lot of people, just introducing yourself, maybe saying, I really enjoyed this work. This is some research that I'm interested in. Are you currently taking PhD students? And that, that list will eventually kind of wind itself down to where you find some advisors that that might want to work with you. And, and a part of that is actually going to the campus. I went to several campuses. I've met with several advisors and it's, it's somebody that you're going to be working with for four years. So you, you I would highly encourage if that's the route you want to go, make sure you get along with that person. That's why I kind of say it's like a little bit about you're signing up for a four-year relationship with somebody. Um, ask other PhD students what it's like working with that person. But th the process really is, what are you interested in? Who's doing what you're interested, what you are interested in doing and and meet them and just see if you mesh. And and also make sure you get paid to go to school too. Don't, don't pay for grad school. That's a big mm -hmm. one. Yeah. But maybe some and of the other PhD students want to chime in on that. Yeah. I would say I, just to just to add, um, meeting with the people of the program before you apply as well. So they put a face with your name and kind of meet you before and as you are prior prior to being an applicant. So they meet you in a little more um, casual, genuine sense, if that makes sense. And then um, they'll um, they'll get to know you. And then when your name comes across the table, they'll remember. Seeing you, remember your name, remember your meeting when compared to other applicants that maybe didn't take that extra step. It shows a great interest in the program. It shows a great initiative. Um, and just 
taking that time to meet someone in person rather than sending an email or do you have time to talk or even a Zoom call? It makes that personal connection and also that personal effort that I think a lot of programs would probably really appreciate at, from an applicant. Jonathan Cable, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, I could speak to my so my experience with like getting into PhD program was I thought pretty informal. Um, I'd reached out to some sports biomechanists in the field that I was interested in working with. I didn't quite have a certain location, so I was pretty open to anywhere in the US. Um, so I ended up in New Mexico of all places. But yeah, I just I sent him an email, kind of just cold calling, like, hey, I know I've read a couple of your papers, I've seen you talk at some conferences. I love if we could, you know, get together and maybe see if you're interested in taking on any students at this time or in the near future. Um, and he just so happened to be, you know, looking around at that time. I was, uh, I sent him, I think, my CV and like a personal statement of like my kind of goals for the future of my career. Um, I know I was up against a couple of other applicants at the time, but after that, um, we met on Zoom and we talked a little bit. Um, and then from there, it was really him like selling me to the department, right? That way you get money to bring me into the the field. I mean, and that's like pretty informal too. It's just me, my advisor, and then like our department head, some people from the college and him just saying like, Hey, I want to bring this guy in. I want to train him for the next four years. I think he's going to help out, you know, X, Y, Z. You should all give me money so I can fund him um, is really how it worked. And uh, so, yeah, it was definitely almost more informal than when I did my master's where I was like, you need to take a GRE, you need to submit, you know, three letters of recommendation, do all this. The PhD process was a lot more you know, like Justin was saying, you know, find someone you kind of link with. And then from there, it's going to be a more personal level of, of getting into a program. I, I don't have much. Oh, apologies. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I, I don't have much experience um, in in interviewing for, for a PhD. I I did it once uh, because the PhD is actually something I'm still interested in. Uh, a couple of years ago, yeah, it was like right before COVID, I was accepted into Columbia's Applied Physiology PhD program. And um, I was only going to go on the basis that I would be working as a TA uh, to help pay for it. And then they COVID, COVID happened and, and the, those positions were just, they weren't able to do anything in person. So, uh, so that I was unable to do it. Um, but the, the interview process, I, uh, I just was looking up PhD programs uh, nearby. So New York City and saw Columbia's, um, I liked it just based on what I was reading online. Uh, I emailed the professor, um, we set up a Zoom meeting, which was very informal. Uh, not the professor, the, the director of the program. Uh, we had a Zoom meeting. It was very informal. We just talked about things that we're interested in studying and what the program would look like in terms of where the classes are, or what kind of classes they are, how many years it would take. And then I just submitted an application after that and then was accepted. But then but then just didn't end up going because of everything that happened. So uh that interview was was very informal. Um, I think everything that everyone here has said so far about interviews is is very on point. Um, preparation is key. You know, if you're applying for a, a program at a school or a job, uh, just knowing what what their what their mission is or what um, they're looking for specifically based on the based on the application or or the the, the job listing um understanding what what they're looking for and then being able to talk about how you would be able to 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 fill that um being organized being on time you know that kind of stuff goes without saying um but also and i think i could speak for a lot of people in the workforce i mean out of every let's say over the past 10 years i've i've sent out 500 applications i might have heard back from like 50 maybe right like like interviews like you don't get and even the interviews that you do get and out of those 50 i might have gotten like 10 interviews and out of those 10 interviews i might have gotten a job once like it's very um i don't want to say it's a numbers game but 
don't take it personal if you don't hear anything. Like it's it's very easy, especially early on when you're out of school to, um, I know I did this where, I, you know, I would go on an interview and I think it went great. And then I wouldn't hear anything and it would be like, you know, so earth shattering. I'd be like, what happened? What went wrong? What did I do? What, how, how could this be happening? It, it just happens and it's not personal. And um, like I said, out of all the interviews I've went on, very, very small percentage, I got asked for a second interview or got a position. So it's not a bad thing. I just see it as experience. Um, if I had a bad interview, I just see it as, okay, what did I learn? And then it, and it does help me in the future. So it's good to send a thank you note post interview. Thank you. Thanking them for their time and um, for the, for the opportunity. So all of this information is very accurate. And just so you know, even as alumni, you can come to career services and do a mock interview for any program that you get into, for any job that you have. And this goes out to the panelists as well. If you ever need to set up a mock interview with any of our career coaches, feel free to reach out and we'd be happy to do one for you. I saw a question in the chat. So uh, Jim Hawkinson asked, what do you panelists think that students in this room as Portland students can do right now to get prepared for their life after this? What's one thing that they could do right now during their time here at Quinn? What, what was that to prepare for grad, like post-grad? Yeah. Network. What yeah, I mean. Really, who you meet right now is going to have an impact, could have an impact on the job you have 10 years later. Like I, I met somebody that uh, when I was in uh, at Cortland that pointed me to a, a, a job when I was doing my PhD, uh, plugged into his network, which connected me to the person that was the medical director for my job right now. So just, yeah, network. If there's somebody out there, whatever field they're in, just reach out and talk to them. Um, if you can get plugged into a network, that that's how you're going to get a job in the end too. It's, it's, it's about who you know. So I highly recommend that you start networking now. It's going to pay off maybe in five years, but it will pay off. Yep. I would say put together a portfolio of some sort um, so you can highlight what it is that you do. Um, so an example for me, with my grad school program, I, I made a website. So when I apply, um, I link that right to the application so they can see uh, my resume, um, some of you know work experience. I'll, I'll have YouTube videos. On the strength and conditioning side, um, you can do like an Instagram page, right? Put some of the stuff that you do, just so I can see as a, you know, somebody potentially hiring you, I can see in real time okay, this is what this person does. Like, I like that, right? Just a good way to, um, that I chose to network. This is not necessarily the way, but doing observation hours with occupational therapists. I did it um, in all different settings. And actually at the end of my um, observation hours, they, uh, they asked me, do you need a letter of recommendation? So prior to even applying to the program, or upon applying to the program, I had three occupational therapists writing me a letter of recommendation, endorsing me for the very career that I was trying to go in. So that was my way that I felt kind of looked good to them. Here's someone who's seen me in their field and helped me observe and kind of have my feet wet saying that, yeah, they would be great for this this field. And then also you have, you still have those connections um, post-grad you know, when you stay networked with those people. So one of them helped me land my grad school internship, internship and I did it with her. Um, one of them helped me to get my current job. So that's a way that I chose to network. And then also those people could be very valuable mentors to you as well um, during your program. And um, when you get in the field, you when you need someone to just, um, you know, consult with, have some questions with, so. I think it's also important to note that networking isn't just good for getting you a job. It's good for once you're in the field as well. So like for our conference, for example, one of the other heads at one of our schools and one of the other associate ATs are all Cortland grads. Um, 
one of them was a year behind me. Um, and then if you've ever taken classes over in athletic training with Dr. Crossway, um, we were classmates at Indiana state and she was, um, at Cortland at the same time as I am. So it naturally gives you essentially like a professional friend group of people you might see at conferences and things like that. Um, or, Hey, I'm having an issue. Can I bounce an idea off of you? So networking kind of goes beyond, you know, just, Hey, help me get a job. It can actually form some friendships. The one thing I would say is, um, Take advantage of as many experiences as you can um, and don't be afraid to get your feet wet. Um, I had a preceptor, my last preceptor of grad school, um, right before I graduated, he pulled me aside. He gave me his three big rules. Um, one of them was to be friendly with my athletes, but not their friend, just to keep that professional line. One of them was treat your education and your professional life like a bookshelf that never fills up. And that the day you stop learning is the day you fail. So that always adds something to your bookshelf. And then the third one is um, never is don't be a cookie cutter. When we graduate, we all come out with the same skills, whatever that is. Um, we all come out with the same basis. It's what you've done, whether it's in observation experience, whether it is a paper or whatever the case may be. It's what you've done that puts you over the top and makes you special. So I actually keep a little cookie cutter in my office as a reminder of that. So don't be a cookie cutter. To add to some of the networking stuff, I know as like undergrad students, it more likely than not, you're not going to conferences, right? That's just not usually a thing undergrads are doing. And it can be kind of intimidating to you know, look people up and just cold call them, email them. Um, so your faculty are a huge asset to you. Um, I knew I was really into biomechanics. So I leaned right in towards, you know, Dr. Dames, Dr. Bauer, Dr. McGinnis. And those kind of three minds helped build, you know, my biomechanics career in that sense, right? Um, Dr. McGinnis really got me into sports biomechanics, helped me working with the Olympic Committee. Dr. Bauer helped me, you know, I was teaching his lab classes. He helped me get into grad school for my PhD program. And with Dr. Dames, I published a couple things on like running biomechanics. So definitely, if you find a field you're interested in, like physiology, you know, reach out to Hokinson. I'm sure he'd be more than happy to have some lab assistants and, and volunteers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, your faculty are a huge, huge asset. So if you know, as you're going through like the intro classes, you're a freshman, sophomore, and you're starting to get into the, the latter end of your undergrad, um, reach out to them because that's that's going to really help open up on that end too. And it's a really easy thing to do. Utilize the things on campus too, the clubs and stuff relevant to your, um, your majors and all the different um, things like that. Um, so if they'll, if they saw you were, oh, in this and this and this club that's related to exercise physiology, um, that'll help polish your resume now for, um, when you're post-grad. So. Yeah. If I hadn't joined SCEMS and written with SCEMS, I wouldn't have become an EMT, which wouldn't have opened me up, opened me up later on to not only being a better athletic trainer as a whole, but then also being able to work with equestrian. That was a key that I didn't even know I needed to get kind of get through the door in that world. So I completely agree. Take advantage of what's on campus because you never know what it'll lead to. I I agree with all of that. Uh, Cortland um, <laughs> it is obviously known for when people here of Cortland. They think of, you know, it's a party school and the dark horse. But uh, aside from that, or no, I would say even better than that. The exercise science program faculty facilities are really, really good. The the professors are amazing. The 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 program itself is amazing. I mean, it's top notch. If you ask me, I I, I would take it any day. Um, a, as far as what's available um in the country in that field, it's it, it's really good, and the professors are really really. Um, there to help and answer any questions you have. So yeah, take advantage of them. Um, the school itself has so many programs and um, I know for me, volunteering and internship experiences on my resume, I think uh, helped me uh, stand out a little bit uh, when, when, when applying for jobs or going on interviews. Um, you know, especially if it's something related to your field, it, it shows that you're, you're willing to put in, you know, free time or extra time in, in, into, into this and, not, and, you know, you're not getting paid for it. You're just, you're just interested in it and you want to learn. Um, so, so constantly learning, uh, like Devin said, is like, I, I graduated Cortland 10 years ago. I am, I'm nowhere near done, like in terms of, in terms of what I want to do as far as education slash career. Um, 
but uh yeah be coachable be open to constantly learning and take advantage of everything that Cortland has because it has some really really good stuff Yo, well, some really great information. And really, I can't say enough about networking. It is one of the most important things that you could do. And if you don't know and you don't have a great network, reach out on LinkedIn and just ask. A lot of these panels were, were gotten through LinkedIn connections, which is fantastic. What other questions do you might you have? Yeah. Uh, I got a question for Justin and Tito. My name's Nathan. I'm a junior and fitness development major. Um, I had a question like, when both of you kind of started strength conditioning, when did you start feeling comfortable programming for specific adaptations with athletes? Yeah, I so, so I did two internships. I, I interned at Syracuse University and then I interned out at UC Riverside in California after that. And then I went back and I volunteered at, at Syracuse. So I was, and I had been personal training since I was 19. So I, I just, I would say immerse yourself in it and just you're not it's not going to be perfect right off the bat but just you know do do your homework what are those what what do the athletes specifically need can you mimic it to some extent to their sports their energy systems etc but I I think if you just immerse yourself on your under your mentors and get some experiences you'll you'll get to a point where you feel confident and it's okay if you look back and five years from now and be like oh I'm better now. Maybe what I was doing wasn't perfect. And that, that's totally fine. I would say generally most athletes or most people can improve their posture. Um, they can improve their strength, um, mobility, speed, where, where you need it, right? So kind of building off what Justin said, what does the athlete need? So, you know, learn the energy systems that they utilize in their sport are they in season versus off season so what kind of training protocols would you do you know with them in versus out of season so those are the kind of you know things that you want to look at when it comes to programming that's great information what other questions might y'all have Um, so I have a question for y'all. Um, and you got talked a little bit about it. Um, but uh, did you ever see yourself in the career you're in now? And how did it change or stay the same for the career you have in mind during your first year at SUNY Corbin? I know that. Sorry, uh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, so short answer is no. <laughs> um, First year in SUNY Cortland, I actually did one semester at Suffolk Community College and then transferred to to Cortland. So so I started in Cortland spring semester of my freshman year. No, I mean, from there, even through my junior or senior year, I, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I, I think I when I first got to Cortland, I was a phys ed major, but very quickly learned that I, I didn't want to do that. Um, and then I always found... Uh, exercise science interesting or at least I started to find it interesting because I was on the track team um so I just liked learning about the physiology of it uh so switched to exercise science major but even then I had no idea what I wanted to do career-wise um once graduation started to approach um I had to start thinking about that and then um you know looked and found quickly that there wasn't you know, most people, at least around the time I was graduating, used exercise science to either go to um, uh, physical therapy school, um, PhD, or people, uh, some some folks used exercise science as like a pre-med, like paired with something else. But um, I know I didn't want to do any of those. Um, so, uh, and there, and with a four-year degree in exercise science, there weren't there wasn't much you could do professionally with that, at least back then. Uh, so I knew I probably needed to go to graduate school. Um, and still, I didn't really know what I wanted to do professionally. I just knew that it opened more doors. Um, so I I, uh, I basically picked my graduate program based on what it was um, 
studying, but also the amount of time that I could get it done, so which I was just in a hurry to be done with it so I could start working. Um, looking back, I wish I, I wish I didn't do that. I wish I took more time. I wish I either went right into a PhD or just, you know, hindsight's always 2020 20, life happens. Um, but basically short answer is no, absolutely. I, I had no idea what I wanted to do in college or even beginning of grad school. So no. <laughs> um, neither did I, I came in as a psych major, switched to special ed and ended in health science. So, um, again, like I said, my thing was, I had so many interests and it was hard to find one field that kind of was, um, an all in one fit. Um, so hence the large gap between my graduation in OE and 2022. So don't be, again, like I was saying earlier, don't be hard on yourself. Take, take as much time as you need to figure out what you really want to do, figure out what you like, get your feet wet. Um, talk to as many people as you know, there's a good resource that I really liked was uh, bls.gov, Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, it'll give you a breakdown of most professions, the average pay, what um, an average day is like. It's a great resource. But um, no, absolutely did not. <laughs> and, you know, it struck me and you got to listen to your guy. I was like, I don't want to be a psychologist like what am I thinking I realized it's something I was very very interested in what um what it that field entailed and um what I learned from it but that doesn't mean it was the right fit for me to be doing as a profession for myself so um yes <laughs> um I came in wanting to be an athletic trainer um again when I at my original school, I was an athletic training major and I transferred due to the recession. I came in as an athletic training major and ended up switching into exercise science to then go back out to go into athletic training. So I never left that goal. I will say, um, I never expected the path to take me where I'm at. Um, I never expected to be at a women's college as its head. Um, I always wanted, I always thought like most ATs, like, oh, I want to go division one football or NFL. I actually cold mailed out my resume to every team in the NFL twice. Like that's where I thought I wanted to go. Um, had no idea when I accepted the job at Sweetbriar that I would find this passion for, you know, working with, with women and those who identify as women, as well as falling into this world of equestrian. Like I was a softball player. I came in trying to play for Julie Lenhart when I got here. Like I was not an equestrian. So getting thrown into this world was something I never expected. And because of it, I've gotten, again, that's what helped get me in with the IOC. That's what sent me to Amsterdam with original research that I did not expect to do. So I'm kind of this weird fluke of, I knew exactly what I wanted to do, but I ended up uh, on the exact opposite end of where I thought I'd end up. Uh, I was like selfish in my journey. I only went into exercise science because like Eric, I was on the track team and I was like, oh, if I learn the science behind running, I'll be an even better runner and I'll be a superstar. So I didn't even like think career wise. I was just going pure athletics at that point. Um, and I did my undergrad in like three years. So I still had eligibility. So like, oh, if I go back to grad school, I can still run at Cortland and still learn more. Um, but then during grad school, when I was like teaching biomechanics labs, um, you know, that Dr. Bauer kind of helped me out setting that up. That's when I really fell in love with, um, and in grad school, you're working on research, you're doing statistics, methodology and stuff. So that's when I started to see like some real academia side to it, um, which made me knew like, yeah, I want to go continue on with school, get a PhD, continue to work on research to can you continue to stay in this kind of academic realm. Um, and the industry work was just because I was a runner, right? And I didn't want to get so lab focused. I want to still have that applied asset. Um, it's like working with the Olympic Committee or working with these tech startups that are working with people um, so I didn't really know until my master's was like, oh, okay, like this is a thing you can do and you can make a career out of, you know, you can teach classes, you can work on research and you can do some consulting on the side. Um, so you don't lose that sort of practical applied sense. But yeah, as an undergrad, I was like, oh, I'm a runner. I, I'm nothing else but a runner and I can use my degree to be a better runner. So, uh, it took a little bit before I, uh, matured up and I was like, oh, I gotta make money somehow to pay some bills. I'd say for me, picking up resistance training, strength training was probably one of the best 
habits. I picked it up in high school and I've just, I, I loved it. And I knew that I wanted to make a career out of helping more people do it. And part, and part of that was first working with athletes. And then when I got to this point, I also became really interested in, in human behavior. So, you know, we have like, this is something that's really, really good for people, but not a lot of people are doing it. Even people that want to do it, aren't doing it. So how can I design interventions to help, help them actually do it? And that's, that's what led to my PhD. And then, you know, when I started looking at the research, there's just no, no behavior change research on, on resistance training. We actually just finished a review. There's like eight studies so far that have looked at why the mechanisms through which um, resistance training, behavior change interventions work. I'm like, this is a gap. So I wanted to focus on that. And even when I was applying for my postdoc and I had uh, it, pseudo interview a lot of my interviews have happened outside of coffee shops it's interesting but anyways my my advisor my future advisor was like you know what do you what do you want to do when you're done it's just like all i know is whatever opportunity where i can help people engage in exercise specifically strength training and make the biggest impact um and so that's just i kind of just had a guiding principle and then just as long as you make progress on that guiding principle the path kind of just illuminates itself eventually like things to tend to come up. So I'd say like, what's it, what's your guiding career principle? And that will, that will morph the job eventually. Yeah. Um, I agree with that. Um, that last point when I graduated in 2019, I had no idea what I wanted to do or what I was going to do. So I was kind of a product of, you know, the people that were around me. So I was around really good coaches and that, you know, kind of pushed me in a direction to get the CSCS. Um, and then I landed a job in professional baseball. It was kind of like a dream come true at that point. Like it was like, I didn't believe that, that it happened when it happened. So it was kind of a surreal experience. Um, then after that, I wasn't convinced that I had done all that I could to be the best version of myself. So for me, the challenge of going back to school um, in PE what was the next chapter. So uh, I've been lucky enough to do both at this point. Awesome. Those are fantastic answers. So even if you don't know now, you might find yourself ended up maybe on one of these screens in the future. You just got to explore and experience some new things. So another question I got, unless does anybody in the audience have a question for the panelists? Um, so another question I got is, what do you think the most impactful thing that you learned during your time at Sturdy Cortland was that helped you uh, in the position that you are today? What was the most impactful thing that you learned at Sturdy Cortland that helped you in the position that you are in today? Take a risk, volunteer your time, um, if there's a, is there, if there's a career that you're interested in, speak to people that are in it, right? Shadow other trainers, shadow other coaches so that you can see, um, what they're doing and, and see if it's for you. And, you know, you may end up having to pivot later on, but at least you got an idea of like, this is what this is. And, and I could really see myself doing this. Take a risk. I was going to say, I, I learned how to dress warm. <laughs> no. Uh, no, I would say time management slash discipline. Um, because of the way my, my life went up until that point, my junior and senior year were like the, the max amount of credits you could take each semester. Plus, plus the, the, the track and field team was very time consuming. So uh, it, just forced me to learn how to be productive in the time that I had available in terms of my coursework. Um, and at Cortland, that's very hard to do. I mean, my senior year, I lived on six Monroe and the guys that I went out, uh, that I lived with went out, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And I was like, I can't, I'm sorry. Like I had to stay behind many nights because I was like, I, this is the only time I have to get this project done. It has to get done. Sorry. You know, um, so time management, that would be my answer. 
I'm going to, I'm going to go off what, um, a little bit what Tito said. Um, don't be afraid to take a risk and don't be afraid to go off the beaten path. You know, um, I spent a lot of time at Cortland comparing myself to others. Um, I had friends who knew exactly what they wanted to do, such as like speech, speech pathology majors. And um, I, it kind of used to get to me sometimes be like, you know, they're so set in what they want to do and they already know. And I kind of wish I was at that point myself. Um, and when I changed majors, I reached out to those professors. I met with them and talked about the opportunities within those majors. And again, like he said, taking that risk, whether it means changing changing your major, going into, um, I mean, and taking a risk for me personally, I'm, I come from an East Indian background. So there are certain professions that are valued more. And, um, it was a lot of pressure for me to switch from psychology with my dad being a clinical psychologist, but don't be afraid to follow your heart, follow your mind. Don't listen to what other people are saying and suggesting to you. Um, don't ignore it but don't let it take you away from where you truly want to go. That's what I would advise people, I believe. And yeah, study, study. <laughs> and I'll just make one more point on that. Um, what Erica or Eric, sorry. And Monica said, um, be mindful of the company you keep. Like, you know, you hear that, you know, cliche of, you know, you are who you're around and that's a hundred percent true. So if you got to cut some people off, cause you can't, you can't bring everybody with you. And if you want to be successful, sometimes that's what it takes, you know, being your authentic self and seeing yourself in, in a, in a, in a better place, right. Creating that for yourself, that reality. And having a circle that's going to elevate you and support you. I would definitely echo what you two both just said. Um, still have good friends from Cortland. The Some really good experiences. I think the internship was really important. Um, and doing the necessary groundwork to make sure that you get the internship that you want. Uh, I was really happy that I was at, at Syracuse University. For, for strength and conditioning, it's probably the best place I could have been in the area. And that involved getting up at 4.30 and driving to Syracuse to just observe the the um, football and lacrosse strength and conditioning coach there so that by the time the interview came around, he was just like, you're not interviewing, you have the internship. You, you know, you came here every Friday at 4.30 a.m. Um, that was a really valuable experience. And then um, maybe fi finding a mentor here. He's, he's not here, but I would, I still consider Dr. Lind an incredible uh, mentor. Uh, he actually just sent me a text before this and said, behave. Um, he was the one that helped, uh, introduce me to more of like the behavioral psychology stuff. So like, like find a, find a mentor, find, find a professor to connect with too. Those would be my piece of advice when you're here. Uh, I have I'd a say... question for the, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, I have a question for the students is, is, uh, Brian, is his name Brian Robinson? Is he still t teaching there? He taught like ethics in, in sport, ethics and sport science, stuff like that. You mean Richardson? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Richardson. Is he still there? Yeah, he is. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, um, like it's something I I thought was really valuable during my, my time at Cortland was uh, just don't be afraid to ask for help. You know, at 19, 20 years old, it can be super easy to feel like you have the weight of the world on your shoulders. Um, between like exams, quizzes, due dates, um, family stuff goes on, grad school applications, GPA to worry about. Um, it can be a super, super stressful time when it should be like a really fun time. You should be learning a lot about yourself, about the education, the uh, career you want to go into, the kind of friends you want to be around. Um, so it should be a big like growing and learning experience, but that can be an overwhelming experience too. Um, so don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help if, if you need it. You know, you're not alone. There's so many, you know, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors at Cortland, and they've probably gone through those similar feelings. So if you need to reach out, you know, faculty members are there to help you, your friends are there to help you, your family's there to help you. Um, there are like services at Cortland that are there to help you. I took advantage of them a couple of times. 
um, and they were really, really great. Um, so yeah, if you ever are overwhelmed, you're like, oh my gosh, like I'm a senior, my GPA is not that great. I don't know if I'm going to get to grad school. Like that's okay. That's a totally normal feeling to have. And if you are feeling that stress, you know, that overwhelming, that drowning feeling, like just kind of reach out to somebody and talk about that because it's important to like verbalize it and talk about it. And then realize you're probably not alone. Like you're probably not the first person to come through with those feelings. Um, and there's ways to kind of deal with that stress. Um, that I think doesn't usually get talked about enough, um, but it can be a great coping skill that you can learn in college and then, you know, relay onto your friends or onto your, you know, children if you become uh, a family person or something like that. Um, I would kind of piggyback off of what everyone is saying, but, you know, fight for yourself and fight for what you want at the end of the day, because again, there are some people you're just going to have to cuss out because they're going to be dragging you down. There are other people who are going to, you know, lift you up. And then there are other people you're going to look over and be like, okay, I need to get their bail money because they're going to lift you up so much. And they're going to take people out. Like that was Dr. Pulasic for me, my senior year. I pretty sure she was ready to throw down for me, uh, my senior year. Cause there was some issues going on with like my senior research. Um, but one thing it's like, and I'm starting to come back to this because um, I am in a very much a workaholic profession is make sure that you are differentiating yourself between who you are as a student, as a physical therapist or a strength conditioning coach, whatever they, and a human being. Um, I'm personally coming back to that because that's something I was really good at when I was at Cornell. Like I was a student one day. I was a, you know, I was in New Sig, so I was a sorority girl one day. I was an EMT another. Like I was really good at that, and then it all started to merge once I got out of school. So finding ways to come back to that and be like, you're not just what your job is, but you are also a human, and finding ways to, you know, take care of yourself in that regard, whether it's lifting or running or crafts or whatever the case may be um so i learned that at Cortland. i've fallen away from it and i'm like actively working to get back to it all great advice all great all great information so with the last question with our last 12 minutes uh i have a two-parter uh, it's not as career focused what's your favorite memory at Cortland? and what's one word what's a one word of advice that you would like to give the students in the room today? We're all thinking of a PG memory right now. You don't need to call people out like that. <laughs> He's not lying though. <laughs> a memory would would probably have to be um, very towards the very end of my my senior year. It was late May. Uh, um, conference track and field championships outdoors. We. We won by a point over Oniata. Um, and I I like to joke that it that I had a big part in that because I in track and field, if you if you place first, you I forget how the points go, but eighth is the last points paying position. You get one point. So I, I PR'd, I had a lifetime PR in long jump and I finished eighth. And eighth was worth one point and we won by one point. So I like to think that I had a big part in that. But it was just it was just a great time. It was just a culmination of like a whole a whole season that was very up and down. And then we finished on a on a very big high. Um one word of advice. Um life happens. Um, you know, we all have we've all had plans and then life just happens and it just goes a different way, and that's okay. Um you're and and it's never too late to learn something new or um just continue to learn and grow your your major or your past or your current position whatever doesn't define you um everyone is everyone you know comes out of comes out of school in a in a in a into a different direction and um it, it doesn't define you like just just speaking with the six of us here on this panel it's we all were in the exercise science field but since then it's almost like six totally different majors you know there's there's so many paths you can take and it 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 doesn't have to ever stop learning doesn't ever have to stop and um you, you can you can decide to 
you know, learn something new or try something new whenever you want your, 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 your current position or, or um, um, uh, degree or, or, or uh, past, you know, education doesn't define you. There's always, there's, it's never too late to learn something new. That would be mine. I would say, um, personally for me, it was walking the stage twice because um, a little bit of my background, I'm from the Bronx, New York City. Um, I didn't have the the most, you know, I didn't have the best resources available to me, especially from an academic perspective. And, you know, along the way and then along my journey, you know, I was doubted. Like I had a lot of people who doubted me. Um, so believe in yourself. Like even if that doubt creeps in a little bit, believe in yourself even when you don't believe in yourself believe in yourself because confidence is something that you manufacture right through your experiences through um trying different things right learning um so i would say be persistent even when you fail and and and, and you know you hear this it's it's so cliche but you fail get back up be persistent don't give up right believe in yourself that's it I would say um, my best memory, I just recall very vividly standing on top of the hill at Spring Fling. And I just kind of took in the moment and just looked around everyone around me. Everyone was laughing and smiling and enjoying ourselves. And I was just thinking to myself, you know, we're all here, different people taking different paths, but we can all come together here and enjoy ourselves and under in this one place, this one college, even just this one place on the hill, and just how being at Cortland meant so much to us in those moments and at that time. And just thinking to myself, like, I will always remember this and I will always remember this fondly as a great time in my life and just to add on to that, I will never, ever forget this. We were at a pizza shop after the bars one time and one of the, the owners had looked at us and said, no one will tell you this, but these are the best days of your life. And he was so right. There isn't a day in my life where I don't want to go back to Cortland and be a student again and go back to those days. So cherish these days, cherish these friendships you make. Um, but also remember you are a student too, but just indulge in this time. You will never have a time again like this in your life um, to just learn and experience and build these friendships. So um, appreciate and value this journey and value every moment. You're going to make us all nostalgic. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, at Cortland from the ages of 18 to 27. So I, I literally grew into an adult at Cortland so it's quite hard to pick an exact uh, moment honestly I think grad school was even better um, because I was I was working as the head strength and conditioning coach I was so proud of developing that program because there it wasn't there before the women's lacrosse team winning the national championship in 2015 and being there that was awesome to be a part of um, seeing the freshmen go from freshmen to seniors that was incredible too and the piece of advice I would probably would echo from everyone else is just like, enjoy the moment. I, during grad school, I lived on the same street with all my best friends. It will never happen again. Um, it's just, it's just not going to happen. I know I, as everyone, <laughs> all our speakers are going to cry. Um, yeah, really, really, really enjoy the moment. Um, and enjoy being with your friends. Um, it, it won't, it won't happen again. So really enjoy it. Yeah, and as the years goes by, it's really hard to get together. Um, I would say probably my best memory was um, getting the email that said I had gotten into grad school because I, very similar to Tito, had plenty of people tell me I was never going to make it. Um, I had my guidance counselor in high school tell me she didn't even think I'd make it through college. I like to call myself Dr. Failure now just to uh just to rub it in her face but 
you know, having that moment and it happened. I was sitting, I lived in the new sick house on prospect and I was sitting on the floor with my housemates just hanging out when all of a sudden the email came through that changed my entire tra uh, trajectory. So getting to share that moment with those people, um, but that was also validation of everything I've tried to do to this point worked and was worth it. Um, and my recommendation besides obviously don't be a cookie cutter would be just remember that you are enough. Um, I tell my students when they come to um, do their rotations with me, I have terrible imposter syndrome, terrible. And the way I try to phrase that in my head is it's like, instead of being like, I'm not enough, it's like, obviously if I'm not, if I'm faking it, it's like I've obviously faked the entire world into thinking, you know, I'm one of the best ATs in the country or, you know, I deserve this opportunity. I've obviously faked my way through it. So I'm going to just keep faking it until I continue to make it. And hopefully that making it will be finding out in 2024, I get to go to the Olympics. So it's a, it's a great day to fake it. So don't be afraid to tell yourself that, that you are enough and what you're doing is enough and don't let everyone else tell you otherwise. Yeah, so I guess to cap it off, my favorite memory was during grad school, we were um, we were in what used to be the uh, like the graduate student office that was in the professional studies building, uh, me and all the grad students at the time. Um, because of COVID, we had to take a comprehensive exam. We weren't allowed to do a master's thesis because it was just too complicated to try to do. Um, so it was really cool, this kind of, that's kind of sound messed up, like collective suffering of all of us taking a night or a day. Um, and we just studied for like six hours, all kind of bouncing off each other. Um, and it was really, really interesting having these like six to eight people who all had like similar career goals, but also different. Um, just staying in the same room, talking with one another, like bonding and, and, and grinding together. That was, that was a really cool time. Um, and then we all went in like the next week to, to pass our cop exams. Um, so just kind of working together in that like cohort, of that unit was, was really, really nice. Um, and then my piece of advice is just understand that while we might have like milestones in our head and like timelines, we want to accomplish things. There's really no timeline. Like you, obviously, yeah, you want to get done maybe four years, do grad school in two years or go to, you know, GT school for another four years, but that is just like suggestions. Don't be afraid to be like, hey, I need to take a year off and I need to figure some stuff out or I need to work and make money before I go back to school. Or I, you know, something happens and then you had to start a family on accident or like, like things happen, you know? So don't try to like define yourself within a certain time frame. Like you can go back to school at 40, 50, 60. You know, I have students in my classes now they are in their 40s. And it's like this, there really is no specific timeline. Mm -hmm. Um, even though like society and like culturally we have like milestones we'd like to hit in certain times, but you know, don't be afraid to, to break mm -hmm. out of that shell a little bit. You'll be surprised too at how many of your classmates and you may even find yourself not even in the field you went to school for. Like I know um, people who are education majors and rec therapy majors selling real estate now. <laughs> so sometimes, like you said, life happens and you fall on a different path and it works out for you. And with that great note, uh, that is why we have these panels, so that way you can learn about these prospective careers and embark on them and know that wherever life takes you, you're in the right place. Thank you, panelists, for taking the time to share your wealth of information, your experiences, your advice with the students here. Thank you, students, for coming. Students, in the back, there's a QR code on the um, uh, table if you just scan it on your way out. And I just want to give a round of applause and a thanks to our panelists. So everyone, all of these people are active on LinkedIn. And if you wanted to go connect with them, I highly recommend it. Go connect with them. Let them know you are at this panel. You want to learn more from them. You want to add them to your network. You never know where it will take you. With that being said, that concludes our alumni speaker series, Career and Exercise Science. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Panelists, stay on real quick for us. One second, if you all don't okay. mind. Thank you guys for attending. I'm going to have you all smile like you're taking a photo.
Okay, ready? Three. Hey, I think I take, take the uh, chat out. Oh, yeah. All right, I, Devin, I like the flag. Perfect. All right, one, two, three. Perfect. Got it. All right. Okay, thank you all so much. Have a great night. Thank you guys. Thank you for reaching out to us. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Um, I'm going to come visit you. So, I can help with my website.